Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Practical Considerations for Fluorescent Cell Staining and Microscopy in Cancer Cell Biology Research. I am Shelley Mulock of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Daniel Beecham. Daniel Beecham is a senior staff scientist in the biology, Discovery Biology Group at the Molecular Probes Campus of Thermo Fisher Scientific in Eugene, Oregon. For a complete biography of today's speaker, click their name in the presenter's window at the top right of your screen. Dr. Beecham, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks, Shelley, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, around the world. And I'm really thrilled to uh, to join you from, uh, let's see here, the late in the evening over here on the West Coast in, uh, in Northwest America, uh, Eugene, Oregon, at the Legacy Molecular Probes Campus of Thermo Fisher Scientific. So um, as Shelley mentioned, I'm going to give an overview of some of the, the practical aspects of, of fluorescent imaging and, um, and using your microscope for staining cells, uh, visualizing processes, um, in this case, uh, as, as relevant, uh, related to cancer, but also in a more broad sense to cell biology research. So um, here at the Molecular Probes campus, uh, this is, our legacy has is and remains uh, uh, fluorescence imaging. Our, Many of our of our foundational tools uh, come from small molecule dyes synthesized by um, a, really a, a, a large family of chemists, and uh, and with the growth that we've enjoyed uh, under Thermo Fisher, we now have a, a, a fully built team of biologists uh, working together with the chemists to develop dyes that together populate a, a large portfolio. Our portfolio dates back um, decades, really, uh, to the origins of the, of the very first fluorescent dyes commercialized for, for research use and, um, and can now be found online. Uh, this volume is, is still up to date and um, you will find uh, a great deal more than I can cover in our seminar here. So today I'm going to talk about, um, as I mentioned, some, some basic uh, approaches for fluorescence labeling. Um, I'll, I'll give an overview about the use of structural tools and functional tools, uh, again, uh, using cancer cell biology, but also other, other uh, cellular processes um, uh, that, that leverage, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the activities of cells. Um, and, uh, and I'll follow, you know, that with, with uh, some, some applications work uh, sprinkled in there. Uh, either you know some excerpts from papers or or case studies we've carried out here. Uh, some of the considerations I'll, I'll I'll review with you are the different types of fluorescent probes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, structural and functional probes, as well as we'll discuss fluorescent proteins and um, other targeting strategies for our dyes, and um, uh, and then also a little bit on on the use of fluorescent probes in three dimensional cultures. So. Uh, here on the next slide, this is the this is really the the, be, the beginning of of the why of the question. What why use fluorescence microscopy? And that's uh, right here in the very top on the top left. You can see looking at the transmitted light of some cells in culture, you see very little. There's there's no con there's nothing there's very little to see. And so we use fluorescence to impose contrast onto an otherwise featureless specimen. So on the left, in the transmitted light, you can see oh, maybe there's some cells there. Uh, there's the white light will will scatter a little bit around the nucleus and the edges of the cell. But when we stain specific structures in the cells, then we get um, the, a much more complete picture. We see the, 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 the footprint of the cell and we can see the organelles inside and how they change either in their spatial distribution maybe how they redistribute over time and how they, they, they can co-localize or, or move together or apart from each other with a treatment. And so uh, to that end, uh, as I mentioned, our, our legacy here is 
historically been uh, small molecule fluorescent dyes uh, across the spectrum um, that, that are engineered either to be used with live cells or compatible with fixation. Um, we have made a great deal of progress uh, over the years in, in improving the performance of the classic fluorescent dyes. You can see at the top, the coumarin and fluorescein to make them more photostable and, uh, and, and amenable to, to, to targeting. So uh, we, we achieve this in a variety of strategies I'll, I'll discuss. Uh, we also have dyes that, that report activity. So dyes that, that, that either report the flux of ions, the membrane voltage, the activity of enzymes, the presence and absence of oxygen and reactive oxygen species. I'll touch on some of these as well. I'll also touch on um, our, our development of a fluorescent protein toolbox. Uh, we've, we've, we've got a, a very uh, convenient way that we've been able to build out to, to develop a means to rapidly express and follow organelles labeled with fluorescent proteins. And a final category here are, are the fluorescent quantum dots, which I won't discuss in this seminar, but also have uh, a variety of, of, of their own very unique uses, uh, often as antibody conjugates in um, either in vivo imaging and sometimes even electron microscopy. So the basic steps of a fluorescence imaging experiment begin the same that any other experiment does. You, you know, you, you plan out what you expect to do um, and you, you really, you know, the things to keep in mind uh, either have to do with the use of dyes for live cells or fixed cells. That's sort of the first decision you might want to come to. And then um, as with any experiment, the, the quality of the data is, is going to be very dependent on the quality of the sample. So of course, you know, these want, you, you generally want to use cells that are as close to their native state or close to the state that you want them when you prepare for imaging. And um, so, you know, good culture conditions and, and handling and so forth uh, will figure into this. Now, this is, this is the, 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 the steps three and four are really the most important for, for you know, purpose of our talk today. So I'll discuss uh, quite a bit about the ways you can label cells. And so labeling is a very general term, but um, in, in, in uh, overall, you know, we, there, there, there are steps that you'd want to take to either titrate the, the concentration of the, of the dye, the time that it incubates with the cells, and, and this is also where you have a careful selection of, of the dyes that you put on the cell. Um, as I mentioned, you want to optimize the label. Um, we, all, everything that, that, that we have produced here and, and, uh, and developed comes with a, a great deal of development effort uh, upstream where we've done a lot of optimization for you, but uh, we always recommend ranges of, of concentration to, to test uh, because that can change depending on what the cells are, what the microscope that you're using is, or what the time, um, time that you're measuring. And then of course, the imaging step. Um, this is also something supported in, a, you know, in, a, in an entirely other seminar uh, perhaps where we discuss our, our imaging hardware. And I'll discuss a couple of different modalities of, of imaging hardware that, that we uh, have here at Thermo Fisher. But, you know, these, these, these rules apply to all fluorescence imaging experiments. So um, in, in planning a fluorescence imaging experiment, uh, you know, again, I, as I mentioned, the advantages and the reasons you use fluorescence imaging are to impose contrast. Um, and you're also permitted uh, for, for many of our dyes to visualize processes as they happen, dynamic processes in changing in time, either by visualizing the, 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 the movement of, of molecules uh, interest inside the cell, maybe structures uh, reorganizing. And uh, in some cases, uh, we have dyes that, that allow you to label an entire cell and watch it moving inside of a population or observe interactions between the cells. Uh, other advantages are, are, of course, just the, the ability to measure cellular structures in vivo uh, in living cells or to fix them in time and analyze them more closely with, with um, a multiplexed dyes uh, to, to uh, uh, interrogate a variety of activities. Some of the important considerations uh, in using dyes to label your cells are um, the, the ability to specifically label. Uh, so hopefully we've taken care of that uh, a fair amount for you, but some cells are very sensitive, so you may need to titrate and find an optimum concentration that, that will prevent cytotoxicity. You have to think of how um, 
how the sample moves. So living cells uh, are constantly moving, uh, minute to minute even, and even second to second for looking at some of the organelles. And this is uh, an important consideration for capturing either time lapse or expecting the sample to look the same at time zero or time five or 10 or 30 minutes. Um, the organelles will often reorganize uh, just on their own. Here's another important consideration. Um, people often overlook this, that autofocus and light itself, in the end, in the absence of dye, uh, this is, is toxic to cells, especially short light wavelength light. High energy light in the UV and, and blue part of the spectrum carries a lot of energy and, and can in fact um, pose a, a challenges to cells and induce some of the processes I'll describe later on, apoptosis and, and reactive oxygen species. And, and to that end, we try to design our dyes having longer wavelengths to avoid uh, that, that illumination in those high energy and harmful wavelengths. And so you want to be mindful of how much light you're actually exposing to the cells, because even without the dye, um, illuminating your cells with plain polarized um, high energy light can be toxic in itself. And last is, is just the need, uh, particularly for live cells, uh, for, for keeping them in as, as happy a physiological state as possible. So um, I'm going to now kind of switch gears to the description of dyes and genetically encoded structures, uh, genetically encoded tools that we've, we've built to, to look at uh, cellular structures in, uh, in situ. And this is... Uh, this is important for cancer research for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly to understand how cells are behaving at a baseline state and then how they change with either the induction of a, of a, of a gene or the addition of a, of a, of a drug. And so, uh, and, and as of course, many cancer drugs are, are target the cytoskeleton. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be describing some of these in detail. And uh, these, these of course can be addressed in uh, as, I, as I've shown here with, with uh, our, our fluorescent dyes that, that are either conjugated to a toxin or in fact engineered to, uh, to bind to specific structures. Uh, I described, uh, I'll, I'll go on a bit more about genetically encoded sensors that, that are targeted in the cell by a gene delivery uh, method that we uh, are very happy with here. It's a, a bit of a, a novel uh, expression method, but uh, this is also permits live live cell and fixable staining. And then uh, a third category over here is, is just the simple staining of, of, of the sample with antibodies uh, that, that are targeted to structures and molecules in the cell. That is, and this, this is entirely relegated to fixed cell samples that are fixed with formaldehyde and often permeabilized with, with uh, detergents and then probed with a cocktail of antibodies and fluorophores. So, um, as I mentioned, the fluorescent, you know, probes themselves are, are just the small molecule versions are, are very easy to use. Uh, they're, they're usually a, a single vial that you just dilute onto the sample. Uh, you have the advantage of uniform labeling, and they can, in fact, become, they can become reporters themselves uh, of, of activity, uh, for instance, as the cytoskeleton rearranges. You want to be mindful of the amount that, that you use. So again, a titration step at the beginning. And you need to be mindful of uh, off-target off staining. So too much, you know, more signal also means more noise. So you need to be mindful of the background and off-target staining that can happen at high concentrations. And you need to be careful about uh, putting too many dyes together uh, or else they will begin to bleed through to each other's channels. And uh, last note here is, is also a little bit more cancer relevant, and that's the, uh, I'll show one clear example of where a dye um, actually affects the cell cycle uh, and you, or, or promotes cytotoxicity and low concentrations are needed to produce the, the, the effect. And so as I mentioned, uh, these structural and functional considerations of cells are important in cancer, uh, largely at just simply to understand either cell cycle control I've got specific examples here. We've got some descriptions of post-transcriptional regulation tools, as well as um, sort of more, more signaling and metabolic uh, stress responses from, from, from the stimuli, and as I'll go on here uh, for the study of, of structure. And we like to use this uh, kind of a cartoon as a as a way to to highlight some of the some of the things we're going to talk about. And so if you think of, of cell health, um, from the, from the birth of a healthy cell 
through uh, stimuli that, that produce a variety of stress changes, through either the induction of death and, and even after death, uh, the things that happen to cell cells. Um, these all, of course, are part of normal cell function that can become perturbed in cancer. And so what I've got here are, are a number of sort of waypoints that, that we like to, to address uh, with that, that, that we've developed either tools or um, identified you know, needs uh, in the research community for means to recognize healthy viable cells, recognize um, uh, the activation of, of, of protection mechanisms intrinsic to healthy cells. And then uh, as, along the way, say this, if you just, again, considering our cell health uh, uh, continuum here, uh, the activity of pre-lethal stressors like mitochondrial toxins, um, drugs that affect the cytoskeleton, cell cycle inhibitors, um, and then the outcomes of those, either by the activation of caspase, damage of DNA, downstream loss of plasma membrane integrity, and ultimately the, the phagocytosis of the dead cells themselves. So uh, looking just early in this, in, this, in this continuum, as I mentioned, structural tools to look at just the morphology. Healthy cells have a known and re, um, reliable morphology. And our addressable dyes show you this uh, very clearly by, uh, in this case, conjugating them to a toxin. So phalloidin is a mushroom toxin that recognizes the filamentous actin in cells. Uh, it doesn't bind to free actin. It, recommends, it recognizes filamentous actin, and you're able to visualize it in fixed cells that have been permeabilized by conjugating to our dyes. So here's a nice example of a, of a dye conjugated to the mushroom toxin phalloidin and the visualization in, in, in cells. Um, another class of dye that I mentioned are dyes that are engineered to recognize a specific binding site in the cell. For instance, DAPI, which recognizes and binds to the minor groove in, uh, in double-stranded DNA. And that allows you to visualize the nucleus, which becomes a very critical uh, point for orienting yourself in the cell in many, many cases. So, um, I, uh, F actin can be uh, conjugated to dyes, as I mentioned, and then you can um, it can be easily multiplexed with with other uh, landmarking tools. So, so in this case, um, fluorescent proteins that are fused to talin, which uh, which uh, lives along the actin microtubules and and at the ends or tips, mitochondria, which of course are are distributed throughout the cell that are labeled with the red fluorescent protein or um, the, the nucleus, which is again stained in blue. The uh, phalloidin conjugates and our secondary antibodies have, have gotten a recent upgrade with the Alexaflor Plus dyes. This has been the effort of a, a great deal of, of research uh, in recent years to improve the photostability and brightness of our dyes. And so here and there in the catalog, you'll see this designation of plus, uh, indicating that um, the, they're, they're they have bright, brighter signal and photo stability than the legacy dye they came from. So here's a nice time lapse um, now using a different tool, using Tubulin, uh, Tubulin Tracker. So this is a, a, a tool that's compatible, a dye that's compatible with live cells. It, it, it binds to, uh, to Tubulin as it's forming. And what I'm, in, uh, what I'm showing in the video that's playing is are some cells dividing where the nucleus is stained in red, and uh, the tubulin is stained with the deep red uh, tubulin tracker probe. And tubulin has, uh, uh, the, the tubulin tracker deep red has a, a far red spectrum, uh, so-called far red. It's, it excites with 647 laser or works in the Psi 5 filter cube. And that means that it, it takes, it, it, it's, those are nice low energy uh, wavelengths to excite cells. It labels cells quickly and gives a, 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 a very characteristic, you know, a staining pattern uh, following the, 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 the cytoskeleton, uh, the tubulin cytoskeleton. And so um, in development of it, one of the things we wanted to make sure is that it, it didn't alter the normal function of cells. So on the left, um, we, we've actually labeled neurons in a neuronal culture uh, and visualized them over several days. Uh, so this time lapse is is in a confocal microscope, looking at a at a slice of of the cells where the dye stays on for. I think this is if I can see the bottom there. It's it's many several uh, sorry up, looks like 65 or 70 hours, um, 
in a time lapse. And uh, so you can see the tubulin, uh, you know, uh, moving around and the this, this cells, of course, uh, staying healthy during the duration. On the right is an example of uh, over-labeling cells. So for instance, if you, if you think you want to have a brighter label and use more dye, what you see on the left uh, or sorry, the middle panel are, are some HeLa cells labeled with the tubulin tracker that are over labeled and they don't divide. They actually, they, they, they freeze in the middle of, of mitosis and the uh, signal just kind of goes away. Whereas if you use uh, less dye, you, you have uh, far, far less impact on the physiology of the cell and you can watch cells divide through several cycles uh, without perturbing their function. So um, this is just a, made to be a lesson to highlight the importance of, of titrating your, your dyes and, and, and optimizing the labeling condition, including the, the um, light intensity and the intervals of, of, of visualization. I'll switch now to, uh, to targeted fluorescent protein fusions. Um, this is another form of fluorescence, of course. And we brought these these uh, these these tools on board oh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, just by reviewing the literature of Gem Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, and using uh, the the targeting sequences uh, that 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 send proteins to specific parts of the cell. So, it's, for instance, the actin cytoskeleton free fluorescent proteins in the cytoplasm, the endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. This list uh, to the right uh, in GFP and RFP represents uh, a good number, I think most of uh, the fluorescent proteins that we've packaged. And the way we've packaged them is in a, is in a, a, a very unique system that is very cell-friendly. This we call they call this expression system the BACMAM system. And so what it allows us to do is to package fluorescent protein uh, sequence into a non-replicating baculovirus, a modified baculovirus that has been engineered to work in uh, mammalian cells. And the way it works is this. Uh, the baculovirus can, of course, is, is replicated in insect cells with the polyhedron promoters and um, and that's fine for making baculovirus, but in our case, uh, we have pseudotyped the baculovirus with the VSVG pseudo uh, pseudotype uh, coat protein, and where it allows it to bind and enter mammalian cells, where the enhanced, um, <clears throat> where, where the uh, CMV promoter driving the gene of your interest is recognized in the mammalian cell. So the mammalian cell ignores the polyhedron promoters of the virus and only expresses the gene product of your of your gene of interest, which has also got an, a WPRE enhancement, RNA export and stability element. And this provides rapid and efficient expression of the, of the protein of your choice in a, in a very portable way. So uh, we've, made, we've made these for you and you just simply buy um, uh, and use these, these products straight off of the shelf without having to grow the viruses. They're also uh, only a P2 uh, containment uh, so they can be used on the bench top and uh, handled regularly like, like any other product or any other reagent. So here are two anti-cancer drugs, latrunculin and cytochalazin, used to perturb either the, the tubule, the microtubulin, uh, sorry, microtubule or actin cytoskeleton. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've got the fusion of the, the, of the tubulin uh, in GFP and the actin labeled in RFP with a uh, reference dye in the nucleus to report where the, where the, uh, the DNA is um, with, our, with, a, with a, a Herxt or DAPI type dye. And so again, these are live cell um, uh, time-lapse videos just showing that, that, that as latrunculin breaks down the, the tubulin cytoskeleton and cytochalasin breaks the actin cytoskeleton down, these, these, um, these are two examples of, of uh, using the structure of, of the cells, these structural cytoskeleton elements to visualize uh, the activity of a drug. And I'm sorry, that's a, these are BSL-1 products, not BSL-2, that's, that's my mistake. Um, the other and last note on, on the back, BACMAM reagents is that they're, uh, very, as I mentioned, they're, they're widely, uh, they'll have tropism across a wide variety of cell types, including many primary cells. Uh, so I won't review them all here, but uh, they're very, um, well tolerated in a, in a many cell types.
Um, here's a series of structural dyes uh, that we've put together in a cocktail uh, following the literature of Ann Carpenter at the Broad Institute. So um, this is a, a procedure called cell painting, and it, it make, makes use of, of specific dyes targeted to the cell nucleus, uh, the dyes that target RNA inside the nucleus and cytoplasm, dyes that target the endoplasmic reticulum, the plasma membrane and Golgi, the cytoskeleton and mitochondria. And, and in, in, in multiplexing these six spectrally distinct dyes, um, what you can get is the, the sort of the fingerprint of, of, a, of a happy, uh, healthy cell. And then what you can do is drug the cell and look at the change of, of these six elements um, in response to the baseline. So either they, they change in spatial orientation to each other or they change in brightness as they're up or down regulated or perturbed in the context of your experiment. And so what this gives you is kind of a, a really uh, a broad phenotyping fingerprint uh, that looks at many aspects of the cell's function at once. I will point out this is largely a tool used for high content imaging, and I'll discuss a little bit about that later on. Uh, these are using an automated microscope with, with multiple channels to quickly discriminate and segment these individual elements and capture them and, and analyze their, their movements with, with uh, machine learning algorithms that, that will basically give you tractable results that I'll, I'll discuss a bit later. The six of these guide dyes together in traditional mic microscopy would are, are become difficult to deconvolve. And so I do want to highlight these are, this is a high content tool, but uh, you can use the individual elements, of course, alone. Okay, uh, another hall hallmark of, of, of cell health is uh, the, the, the uh, proliferation and proliferative capacity of cells. And this is a, a big one for cancer research as well. So uh, healthy cells divide and, um, and, uh, and, and, and then you know, perturbations to the cell cycle show up as either changes in the number of uh, the rate of, of, of proliferation or just in many cases, just the number of living cells. Um, this is the probably the most effective way that we've deployed this technology called click chemistry. Um, we actually were the first to commercialize uh, and license click chemistry back in, oh gosh, I want to say it was 2006 or seven that we began work on click chemistry. And it's to build the system that I'm about to describe to you. But of course, click chemistry was made famous just last year uh, when the inventors won the Nobel Prize for the development of this tool set. And the reason we like click chemistry is that it is entirely bioorthogonal. It th This is the name given to the um, copper catalyzed cycloaddition of an azide over there on the left in the letter A to an alkyne here on the right in letter B. And that produces a conjugated protein, uh, sorry, a conjugated structure that can be tagged onto proteins. And it's a, it's a way to, to quickly mix and match uh, targets with labels is the way that we've used it. But it also is used uh, to, to generate you know, specific binding sites on antibodies for drugs and antibody drug conjugates and uh, many, many uses. It's very small, so much smaller than the streptavidin and, and, and antibodies or even fl uh, fluorescent proteins. And um, we have uh, um, excellent control of the specificity uh, with click chemistry and very low backgrounds, owing to the fact that there are no um, endogenous azines or alkynes in the sample. So to visualize proliferation with click chemistry, uh, you use a metabolic incorporation strategy. Historically, this was done with brominated deoxyuridine, which is incorporated into dividing cells at the, at the regular intervals wherever a thymidine would go. You, a brominated de deoxyuridine is introduced, and the, then the cells can be fixed and permeabilized and some, some treatments. They ha have to do an, actually an acid treatment and, and a fair amount of permeabilization to make the brominated deoxyuridine accessible to a, a fluorescent labeled antibody. So a specific antibody for BRDU will then show you cells with newly synthesized DNA. We sidestep a lot of the, um, de the detection step with that by using a much smaller handle, the, the ethanyl deoxyuridine over here on the right. So this is our strategy with using click chemistry to detect newly synthesized DNA. So EDU is incorporated in, into newly synthesized DNA, and then it's detected in a single step with the azide complement uh, of the dye. 
And so what that looks like is, and so, and of course, the reason that that, that is helpful is, is that you, by using just a single step, you have a much, uh, you have much cleaner tissue architecture. You have pres preservation of, of the cellular structures that you can see here um, with, with the uh, tubulin uh, stained in blue and mitochondria. Um, uh, stained here, stained here in, uh, in in green, but the the, the newly divided cells uh, show these red nuclei where the where the clickable ethanyl deoxyuridine has has a, has appeared, and in fact people feed ethanyl deoxyuridine to animals uh, and then can follow up and and visualize in situ uh, in tissue slices to see where newly born cells are uh, either uh, with with high frequency of occurrence like the gut or where they in places where cells divide more rarely, like the brain. And uh, of course, you know, as you can imagine, proliferation is is used to interrogate the activity of drugs. Uh, so, for instance, in this one, etoposide, uh, a, no, a well-known uh, uh, toxin used in in cancer research, uh, here showing a dose-dependent, you know, effect um, on cells over in a 24-hour treatment with a high concentration to the left and a number of, of freshly divided cells tapering off uh, over at the far end and high concentration of the drug and increasing in number uh, to the right at low concentration. In coupling this with the high-content instrumentation, uh, in this case, the CX-7 laser platform, the um, uh, you can then uh, estimate the the percent the percent of the cells that have recently divided and look at the titration of 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 that cell number in a in a in a quantified uh, uh, recording uh, with 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 the cell count on the y axis and uh, and quickly determine the activity of of, of a drug and and how it and in, in its uh, activity on proliferation. Um, I'll leave off one more uh, discussion of click chemistry looking at, at RNA. Uh, that's another, of course, aspect of, of a healthy cell division. And so the same approach that we've used for, to visualize nascent DNA, nascent newly synthesized DNA, can also be used to visualize RNA. And this is just in, instead of, uh, uh, instead of um, ethanyl deoxyuridine, we have um, ethanyl uridine. So, uh, this is incorporated into newly synthesized RNA and detected in a single step with click chemistry. As you can imagine, click is very versatile, and um, the click in itself would be uh, uh, many different seminars that I could cover on DNA, RNA, protein, and post translational modifications. Uh, but here I've just touched on uh, proliferation. Um, also, in the spirit of, of visualizing RNA, uh, we, we have a, a, a very highly evolved um, um, immunocy immunocyto immunochemistry uh, uh, application with our view RNA tool set. This allows you to actually visualize individual copies of, of RNAs um, in cells and look carefully at their spatial distribution with uh, a, a strategy designed to recognize the RNA with specific probes that are made in a custom uh, in a custom assay and then detected with branched DNA attached to many fluorophores, providing an amplification step for up to four transcripts that can be detected simultaneously. Um, I'll point out also that, that our system has the advantage of, of a very fast and collapsed workflow uh, uh, which again keeps cell structures intact and is compatible with antibody staining uh, in, in further multiplex if you want to see more things besides uh, the RNA in the cell. Uh, I've put in a couple of examples of use in the literature uh, just quickly to highlight you know people use this assay to either visualize the translocation of a message uh, of an RNA or just the disappearance of it in response to a drug, drug treatment. So here, uh, nucleosamide and triphosin are, are used to induce the translocation of a, of a, of a target, um, either stained with an antibody and uh, localized uh, in copy with the, uh, with the um, um, uh, view RNA kit. Uh, the, the bars in red show a control treatment. These are essentially fixed cells uh, showing that, the, of course, the RNA is not incorporated and, and uh, no change is detected. Um, but we can see a knockdown or, or translocation of the signal uh, with the treatments of the drugs. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to switch to some fun stuff. This is much more my wheelhouse and a place where I have spent a good deal of my personal time. I'm uh, still very much a, a bench scientist here uh, at the campus, and I, I work on uh, functional probes. I, I um, as with my training in neurosciences, has a lot of focus on ion sensors and voltage, uh, but we also develop probes to visualize other uh, activities in cells, and it's in this case, the next several are looking at uh, the reactive oxygen species produced by healthy cells. Um, healthy, and, and, and that's, 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 so both healthy cells and stress cells produce reactive oxygen species. And what can sometimes happen is the cell loses its ability to buffer reactive oxygen species or a drug will induce the overproduction of reactive oxygen species. But um, in, in, this, in both cases, these are both good um, mechanisms these are both these these represent a tool a class of tools that can be very helpful in identifying mechanism of action in a in a in a either a, a toxin treatment or 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 trying to understand how a gene has altered the, the metabolism of a cell um, particularly with a mitochondrial phenotype people have used um, our our classic dyes to study reactive oxygen species for many years um, the reduced fluorescein dyes uh, suffer from uh, the inability to use them in complete media and they photo bleach very quickly. Uh, these cell rocks deep red dyes are uh, and, and now uh, newer green and orange forms recognize reactive oxygen species and can be uh, 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 fixed and are very photostable um, re reporting activity to a wide variety of, of ROS species that can be uh, found in a table that I won't describe here. Uh, the nice thing about them though is, uh, yeah, they, they work on both live and fixed cells. So you can actually visualize the, the activity of the dye, in this case, uh, in multiplex with a mitochondrial membrane in, uh, indicator. So TMRM is a mitochondrial dye that, that stains healthy mitochondria. Um, it shows up bright red at the beginning of the recording. And then uh, the reactive oxygen dye uh, is in fact a, a nuclear binding dye that, that binds to DNA upon oxidation. So uh, the dye is dark until it is oxidized and then it's permitted to move to the nucleus and bind DNA and produce a very, um, a very localized and bright signal in response to reactive oxygen species. So you see the, the mitochondria are becoming dimmer with amenodione treatment and the ROS signal is coming up in, uh, in time. Um, Next couple of slides are on another very important pathway in cell biology uh, and, and particularly cancer research, and that's the activation of caspase enzymes to induce DNA, uh, sorry, to induce cell death. So programmed cell death is, is a well-known uh, phenomenon, and the main executioner of programmed cell death is caspase 37. Um, caspase 37 uh, induces uh, ultimately cell death by, by just the non-specific, not non-specific, by, by, by cleaving cells at a specific uh, site in their protein sequence using recognizing the DEVD target sequence. Um, and so what our strategy in developing a caspase sensor was is taking the DEVD caspase recognition sequence and fusing it to a DNA binding dye. Much like I just showed you of the DNA binding dye that binds only after oxidation, this is now a dye that can only bind after cleavage by caspase. So at rest, the, the dye is dark and cannot see anything, but when you induce caspase, in this case with uh, the activation by uh, starosporine or another um, uh, toxin drug, the dye is cleaved away from the DEVD, can translocate to the nucleus and produce a fluorogenic signal. The nice thing about here is that um, these are there's actually a lot of advantages. It, you don't have to wash the cells or remove the dye or the media for it to work. Um, the sample can be fixed and, and counted afterward, uh, permeabilized and stained with other things. And you get a lot of amplification of the signal. So every caspase enzyme stays active and it keeps cleaving dye uh, as long as it's around. So um, back to the, I'll, I'll just sh show this video one more time. This shows, uh, again, that a, a multiplex experiment where we're watching the mitochondrial membrane potential in red uh, disappearing uh, upstream of the activation of caspase, as you would expect in a temporal sequence. 
We've recently developed a GFP form of this die, so it's also a CASPase 37 sensor that is now operating in the red, uh, far red channel. And this can be easily multiplexed now with the green fluorescent protein or deep red dyes for cell death um, or the, the, the nucleus in blue. So further just in increasing the multiplex capabilities of, of, the, of the system. See if I can go to the next slide. Oh, and this just shows another video of this uh, of the caspase red in action. So now we've we've got a different live cell stain, the calcine green. Uh, so healthy living cells uh, will will stain brightly with calcine AM ester, which accumulates inside and is maintained there. Uh, and then upon treatment, you see the disappearance of the green signal, and the appearance of the red apoptotic nuclei. Uh, from the from the caspase red version of the uh, the three seven caspase three seven sensor. Um, I think our last application with caspase, or second to last here, uh, is just another demonstration that, of course, um, you can count the cells uh, in high content. So you can look at the percentage of the of the cells that are caspase positive, either at different drug concentrations or different time points and quickly um, uh, export that data in, in, in graphic fashion with, um, with our high content automated analysis. And as another caspase multiplex, this just highlights the, the appearance of, of reactive oxygen and the appearance of caspase signal um, up, you know, uh, in, in temporally in time. So uh, with starosporine, you see a, a rapid induction of, of reactive oxygen followed by uh, a later induction of caspase 37 so here's another uh, another uh, example taken from the literature where uh, researchers have taken the mitochondrial dye that i mentioned so mitochondrial dyes like tetramethylrhodamine methyl ester the tmrm or in this one the mitotracker orange dye these dyes uh, stain healthy mitochondria based on the membrane potential of the mitochondria. So they accumulate and stain brightly in, in healthy cells with, with highly polarized mitochondria. And then they demonstrate uh, the activity of, a, of the, the drug quercetin uh, for uh, as it decreases the mitochondrial membrane potential, you see drop in the signal from TM, uh, from mitotracker orange on the right. And then you also see uh, the appearance of, of cell death uh, over on the left. In, with a cytox green dye. Cytox green and dyes in that family um, don't stain live cells. They, they're, they, they're, they're unable to enter live cells with intact membranes and can only enter cells and stain the, the nucleus after uh, the, the membrane has broken down and permitted entry. So you can see an increase in cell permeability and consequent cell death uh, parallel with a, a decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential. The dyes that we use to label cells are, are often um, called trackers, and these, these get used in measurements of, uh, they're often just used to follow cells in proliferation. Uh, but here we also like to use them to follow motility. So um, on the left is, you know, an angiogenesis assay, uh, which is, is, you know, one of the consequences of, of, of uh, the tumor growth. And on the right is a live cell uh, version of, of a, something like a wound healing assay where you can visualize cell mobility in, a, in an artificially induced scratch uh, visual, visualized in uh, live cell uh, time-lapse mi microscopy on the right. And um, so th this uh, cell tracker deep red dye is gonna appear several more times. Uh, it, it either can be used to label cells that are used to induce activity. Uh, in this case, we have a, a cancer spheroids that are uh, over here on the left, stained uh, with the caspase dye, uh, showing the basal level of 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 of, of uh, apoptosis, and then uh, when they're co-local and the, when they're co-incubated with activated T cells, you see an increase in apoptosis. Or if the T cells are not activated, um, then you see less apoptosis, and that can be quantified, of course, as well in high-content imaging. Um, one other application, also multiplexing the mitotrack, uh, cell tracker deep red, um, feeding the natural killer T cells, 
uh, to, to uh, a, a, a SKBR3 spheroid, uh, 3D culture, where uh, the cell event caspase green is, is somewhat activated by, by natural killer cells in the absence of trastuzumab um, antibody, and uh, Herceptin, that is, and, uh, or greatly increased in the presence of, of the antibody, which increases the recognition and killing potential of the natural killer cells. These things, uh, as I mentioned, you know, 3D cultures uh, are, are obviously very popular and, and have a lot of relevance to tumor biology. And so you can uh, take, take individual ass assays like the ones I described, the, the induction of caspase uh, green and the decrease in signal from mitotracker orange and visualize uh, dose response to a drug as, as higher concentrations of niclosamide, you see a loss in mitochondrial signal and a gain in the, in the caspase signal in two different cell types. Um, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time here now uh, on the visualization of, of internalizing processes, um, uh, either phagocytosis or, or trafficking of, of membrane targets, which are both um, relevant in, in cancer therapies. Um, so just this is just meant to describe the strategy. These are dyes that are pH sensitive, that are dark at neutral pH and become brighter as they are acidified. So when the dyes are conjugated, in this case to bacteria or other cells, then they can be fed to macrophages and you, you see the, the signal appear over time as they bind to the outside and are transported in. You can also conjugate Frodo pH sensitive dyes to, to uh, targets outside of cells like, in this case, the low density lipoprotein or to antibodies. So our, our antibodies, of course, are, are, as known, are known as much as being therapeutics as they are for our own body's uh, help, helpful function. And so labeling antibodies and making them pH sensitive gives people the means to visualize where the antibody is going in the cell. Uh, so in this case, you can visualize the location of a labeled antibody in the lysosome, where it is co-localized with the cell light GFP lysosomal fluorescent protein uh, lamp, and, and then uh, multiplexed with uh, the nucleus for, for landmarking, and, and once again, our friend, the cell mask deep red, uh, very versatile dye to show you the plasma membrane. A new version of, of the, our pH dye that we're very pleased to uh, announce is a longer wavelength. This, this is a new dye that works out in the deep red channel and has, uh, and one other important change is we've modified the pH that activates the dye, pH 5. And this means that the dye turns on later in the endosomal pathway. And it also means the dye is darker at neutral pH. So we have a much larger signal to noise in, uh, again, measurements of phagocytosis on the left, as I've shown you, or, uh, you know, uh, antibody-directed cellular phagocytosis of, of labeled cells on the right. Um, but in the biggest, uh, I, th I think the biggest impact is uh, the, the ability to efficiently label uh, antibodies, uh, in this case, uh, again, uh, trastuzumab, uh, Herceptin drugs, that, are, that have the mechanism of binding to EGF receptors on the outside of cells and are, are quickly translocated inside to the late endosomes and lysosomes where the dye fluoresces brightly. So you can see the signal to noise of, neutral, of, of, of labeled antibodies at neutral pH of 7.5 to an acidic pH and see a very large signal increase owing to a much smaller background signal um, at neutral pH on the lower right. So um, we now have, you know, what we call classic and these new uh, deep red uh, uh, antibody labeling kits that are, are you know, uh, suited to the, the, either the color channel or the pH range of, of, of the user's interest. But uh, these all leverage pH gradients to visualize activity in cells. Um, and so to that end, uh, visualizing the internalization of, of, of Frodo labeled antibodies in cells. You can see the antibodies are, are readily internalized in, 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 in steroids made from cells that generate the uh, EGF receptor. And, uh, and when the antibody is by itself, it's internalized, but when the antibody is, is also labeled with a, a payload, an anti-cancer drug, MMAE, 
as is done in the case of this trastuzumab label, then you see the induction of caspase activity. So you can see the consequence of the internalization and the cell death that follows. So to that end, um, as I think we're at time now, I'm going to uh, spend a minute just directing you to um, a, a, a newly built uh, and highly, um, uh, we've, we've, our, our web presence has, is always changing. And so we've got a, 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 a very uh, thorough cancer resource, cancer research resource center that goes, of course, far beyond the scope of this uh, small presentation I've given here today across, you know, immuno-oncology to solid tumor research. We have some great teaching tools uh, over here on the right. Uh, our, our imaging university school of fluorescence will take you through step-by-step uh, -step, uh, labeling and, and de detection strategies along with our learning center. And the spectral viewer uh, is, an, is a very important tool in understanding which dyes can be multiplexed with, with each other. And last of all, I want to take a moment um, to, to speak to our antibodies. I got to speak to antibody labeling and, um, and some of our, our newer um, uh, approaches there. Uh, but our, our antibody catalog has is, is now been completely reinvented with um, a lot of our own applications data as well as validations from the literature. So the, the search for validated antibodies is much easier uh, with a, a, a tool that we generated. So I will pause there. I think I'm at time and I'll thank everyone for their attention this afternoon, uh, wherever you are. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to, uh, let's see here, turn it back over to um, my host and uh, and look forward to uh, answering your questions and it, whatever I can't answer here um, we'll encourage you to reach out electronically and I'll do my best to follow up as timely as possible. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, um, we wish to image ourselves in the native unperturbed state as possible, but still be able to quantify them. Uh, for example, counting, morphology, et cetera, midway in our experiment, uh, what would you suggest? Okay, well, so that's sort of back in the in the early part of my slides where I was mentioning the importance of happy and healthy cells. Some of our cell, some of our microscopes have on stage incubators, um, and this allows you to to visualize and to culture cells long term in the context of an imaging experiment. Um, the selection of dyes is the other uh, important piece, and so not all dyes will be compatible with with live cell imaging, and it's important to you know, read a little bit about the dyes before you uh, uh, just try to label them and, and expect the cells to behave normally. So um, I showed examples of dyes that, that are very, that are completely harmless to cell function, like the uh, cell tracker or the pH sensor dyes, even the caspase dyes, you know, you're showing the cell at the end of its life, but it's not disturbing the cell to make the measurement. The dye can be present for many days uh, and not affect the cells, and it doesn't activate until the ca caspase is, is turned on. But um, really, the, the same rules that apply to cell culture, uh, maintaining the, the oxygen and the, uh, sorry, the carbon dioxide and, and the humidity and temperature um, are, are all in effect here. And so um, either on-stage incubators or the you know sort of uh, careful culture of of, of your cells and, and uh, measurement with the appropriate reagents is is the key to success. Oh, excellent! Thank you so much for that. Um, our next question is: I heard that DAPI has quite a broad spectrum on the emission and often interfere with other fluorescent channel channels. Is there any alternative dye for DAPI? Uh, they said like SYTOX um, without disturbing GFP and RFP signals. Yeah, uh, I have a specific recommendation there is a dye called Herxt. It's um, difficult to uh, to pronounce, uh, but it's spelled H-O-E-C-H-S-T, Herxt. And uh, this is a this is a, a narrower spectrum dye. We also have a long uh, spectrum dye uh, that's used in, in our, uh, to, to segment nuclei in high content imaging called Nucleotracker Deep Red. And um, uh, 
this is a, a also a, a, a live cell uh, but fixable dye that can be uh, used to preserve the, the the green and 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 inner red channels. Uh, okay. That is that's alternative to DAPI. Okay. There there are many nuclear dyes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> okay. So the the next question is. Um, for be all analysis, which panel is best? How can we use image analysis software easily? Sorry, so for, for what type of analysis? B? Uh, it says be all, so capital B and capital A L L. Be all. Oh my gosh, I'm afraid I don't know what type of analysis that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> we do have automated um, analysis, you know. Uh, packages that either go with our, our microscopy suite um, using, uh, so I showed examples of the EVOS microscope and it has an onboard analysis package called Celeste, C-E-L-L-E-S-T-E. -E -E, and that's a very powerful um, sort of uh, smaller scale imaging analysis program that, that will quickly automate and quantify imagery. And then uh, our high content imaging uh, packages use a much more sophisticated software that will quickly generate uh, graphic data from either percent positive cells or even the trans translocation of signals within a cell, and that's that's um, maybe th that's 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 probably the best approach to getting a multiplex um, read of up to seven different channels okay. using high content imaging. Perfect. But okay, if, if, if someone follows up with the BLL, I'll do my best to understand, but I, I actually don't recognize BLL. BLL. Okay, no worries. I'll let you know if it comes through. And our next question is, what would be suit a suitable application for a whole cell label dye or labeling dye? Uh, why do I see cells bubbling during live cell imaging experiments? Um, a suitable application for for labeling cells, like like for instance, um, I showed several examples with the um, cell tracker deep red, uh, is either visualizing their motility, so visualizing as they move around in a in a population, even for tracking them as they divide. So you have one labeled cell and it divides, and then you have two labeled cells and three and four, and the signal goes down. Uh, with each division, but that can also be used to quantify how many cells in in a in a in a population have recently divided. In fact, it's done in flow cytometry. But uh, mm -hmm. for for traditional imaging, people label the membrane of cells just to to give them contrast and see where they are among a population. So, for instance, the the the, the cell tracker deep red uh, cells that I I was showing you in the organoids um, and and spheroids were uh, uh, labeled just to give the camera something to focus on. And then really the activity is happening in the green channel. Bubbling happens um, uh, often as a result of, of either cytotoxicity from overloading with dye or too much uh, phototoxicity. So light itself can, can be toxic to cells. And so you may need to adjust the, uh, the intensity and duration of the exposures of, of the of the light on the cells to avoid phototoxicity. Um, but there are a lot of things that can cause bubbling and that could also indicate an osmotic problem with the with the solution that you're labeling with. Mm. Um, I'd have to see or understand a bit more. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, how long does transient expression with cell light reagents last um, or primo sensors? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so I, I described the BACMAM uh, uh, protein expression system that we've used to, to package uh, fluorescent protein and, and biosensor tools. And um, it's a CMV driven promoter. And that means that you see pretty fast expression. And every time the cells divide, they take half of the copy number with them. So you can expect to see the onset of expression in six or eight hours and peaking at about 15 to 16 hours. And then it will last for several days. It really depends on the target. Uh, so some, some, some proteins are turned over very quickly. The membrane labels are, are you know, um, they 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 they're 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 always new membrane is being made, and so uh, you can either get long lived expression by by just retransducing with with more of the with more of the viral uh, uh, delivery or or culturing it continuously in the presence of it. 
um, but you can count on 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 you know minimum of, of two days up to five or six. Okay, perfect. Um, our next question, uh, Dan, is I'm dealing with less abundant rare target and using an antibody validated for ICC, but still can't see my target. And they're wondering if you have any advice for them. Yeah, that. so I didn't really get to spend much time on it, but uh, we have a couple of strategies for signal amplification. Um, so this is now used for, for as you mentioned, la rare or low copy number targets. Um, I think the, the most commonly used is uh, using a secondary antibody to detect your, your protein of interest. So you have the primary antibody, which, which, which binds to the protein, and then you have either a polyclonal or a pooled monoclonal cocktail of, of labeled secondary antibodies to recognize that target, and each of them will have uh, many dyes, and that will provide signal amplification. Another strategy for signal amplification without the need for secondary antibodies is uh, a tyrus, it's called tyramide signal amplification that uses an enzyme conjugated to the second anti secondary antibody that produces um, a large number of binding sites for a fluorescent dye called tyramide uh, conjugated to our Alexa floors. And that will, that will produce a high copy number of of fluorescent targets uh, in the vicinity of, of your target of interest. So tyramide signal amplification and secondary antibodies are my two main recommendations for signal amplification. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. So our last question for today is, I've found protocols for probes in 2D, but not for 3D models. Uh, do you have any general advice for that? Yeah, we we have a well. It's it's different for each die, and and now uh, with with each of our dies, you'll find um, uh, uh, directions to a 3D. We actually have a, a 3D resource that I probably should have mentioned on our website. Um, what you'll often find is that you know the dyes that you use at a lower concentration in 2D either have to be increased in concentration or incubated longer time in 3D. Um, but but not all dyes are created equal when it comes to 3D. The penetrance of the dye and the 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 the, the cell's ability to tolerate the dye can change quite a bit in 3D. So I showed examples of well characterized 3D dyes uh, in the in the cell event dyes, then the um, some of our mitochondrial dyes, and the uh, 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 say for instance the the the, the cell tracker uh, deep red. Um, but I, it really is a case by case basis, and and it, it's it's usually described in the product sheet for each die if it's 3D compatible, or uh, it's more likely going to be captured in our in our 3D cultures uh, uh, web portal where there's a great deal more information relevant to tissues and uh, and and uh, multicellular uh, 3D and and uh, organoid structures. Okay. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, do you have any final comments for our audience today? Um, no, just th thanks so much for, for spending your, your afternoon with us here. And, and um, we do welcome any, any questions. We have an excellent you know, technical support team and whatever they can't uh, answer, they send to us in research and development. So I welcome the chance to, to speak with people in the field as often as I can so I can better understand uh, problems and develop in, in their direction. So um, sometimes we can help out from research and development as well. So we, we look forward to hearing from you and, and thank you again for your time. Absolutely, awesome. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Beecham, for your time today and for your important research. Uh, we'd also like to thank Lab Roots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience as well for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Uh, questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Uh, this webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who have missed today's live event. Until next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.